let's solve a couple of questions on the ideas we've learned so far. First one, assertion reasoning. When ethyl alcohol is added to water, boiling point of water increases. Interesting. When a volatile solute is added to a volatile solvent, elevation and boiling point is observed. Now the reason is <laughs> trying to help you figure out the answer, to be honest. Let's highlight things that are important here. Uh, yellow stuff is the solute and yellow, green stuff is the solvent and blue is the final inference, right? What's happening? Be careful here. The solute is volatile and so is the solvent, which is why you're going to have to see what their interactions were before it was mixed and after the mixing happened. So uh, from you know the standard way of doing this, you compare AA and BB interactions. This being the, I'll cut it one more time. This is the solute and this is the solvent. Now in ethyl alcohol, there's already hydrogen bonding that exists and you disturb that by adding water to it because of which these interactions are stronger than AB interactions. AB here being ethyl alcohol and water. In fact, there's positive deviation from ideality. What if I need a positive deviation? P dash is greater than P at every point in time. Okay. And the temperature falls. What temperature? Sure, just like you have pressure versus mole fraction, you can also plot temperature versus mole fraction uh, graphs. And this is so much, the deviation is so much that this forms an azeotrope, a minimum boiling point azeotrope. Clearly, the temperature will be lower and so much so that, yeah, there is no way that the boiling point would increase. In fact, it would decrease. Let me write that, cut that off and write that here. And this is going to be a depression in boiling point. Is that a new thing? See, I know what you're thinking. You may be like, hey, hold on, but I learned a formula around this. Yeah, if one is a solvent, two is a solute, and it's a non-volatile solute, then I can use all of these expressions and do all of this. Did you notice something interesting here? In all the equation that I just wrote down, <laughs> the key point here is non-volatile solute. This right here is a volatile solute. Look at the yellow stuff. If it were a non-volatile solute, then both of these statements would be correct. But this is a volatile solute. Both of them, the solute and the solvent are volatile, which is why the answer, according to me, is going to be both of these are incorrect. So be careful, read the question carefully, don't mess things up in a hurry. That was cool, right? Here's another question. When MgCl2 is added to water, a depression in freezing point is observed, okay? And the lowering of vapor pressure of a solution causes depression in freezing point. This one seems pretty direct, but let's just go through the motions and do this properly. Uh, in yellow, I've got a non-volatile solute. Sure, it's an electrolyte, which means that MgCl2, when dissolved water, will produce more than one, just one particle. If I, if I put in one mole of MgCl2, I'll probably get more than one mole of MgCl2. Mg plus, Mg2 plus, and Cl minus. That's the split that happens. But that's not something we have to worry about right now. What happens here, let's go back to the first principle. Let's just revise the theory a little bit. Now here, I've drawn the phase diagram, pressure versus temperature diagram, basically, for water, that's the solvent I have, that's the pure solvent. And uh, I can also draw the line which has a solute, a little bit of non-volatile solute. Let me write that here, non-volatile solute. And that gives me a relative lowering of vapor pressure on every point of the graph, which is why a new line is traced. And what that does in a sense is pushes the boundary of liquid on both the sides that you can see very clearly in terms of an elevation and boiling point on the right hand side here and a depression and freezing point on the left hand side of this same graph. Okay, so in a sense, liquid stays liquid over a larger temperature range. This is a cool takeaway from this. The long story short, both of these are absolutely correct. So no trick here, straightforward question. Okay, let's take it up a notch. We're going to solve a numerical now. What mass of a non-volatile solute can be dissolved in 92 gram of toluene? Okay, that's the solvent to create a solution that has a vapor pressure that is 90% of its original value. Huh, 90% of its original value. So what do I need to do here? I'm going to highlight things that you need. Pause the video here and try and solve this question. Clearly, one is a solvent, two is a solute. This is where you pause. Okay, unpause. The expression you need to start this off is delta P by P1 naught is X2. That's what relative lowering of vapor pressure works. Um, and vapor pressure is 90% of its original value. What does this really mean? Hmm. Okay. 
So if I took the initial vapor pressure to be say just P1 naught, just pure solute, pure, pure solvent, right? Just a solvent. The new vapor pressure P will be 0.9 of that. That's all this means. Okay, cool. Hmm. But here's an interesting thing. I have written this in yellow and this in yellow, which means that they are relevant, right? This is M2. Okay, what I need to find out is W2. What are M and W? This is in the derivation, in the theory parts. Please revise it if this nomenclature is new to you, if these symbols are new to you. But I need to figure out what exactly toluene is. This is the symbol, right? It's benzene and one hydrogen is substituted and you get a methyl group right over there. Why am I doing this? Because I need to know the molar mass of this solvent. To get that, I need the structure. And the molar mass happens to be 92 gram per mole which is M1. Oh, and W1 also is given to you right on top. Okay, so everything is given to you. What I need to find out is W2. I think we can do that. But what is X2 here? Well, X2 is simply going to be equal to 0.1. Why? Because, because, look, what is this? This is delta P. Delta P was P minus 0.9 P. Specifically, let's put P1 naught, P1 naught, divided by P1 naught. This just gives you 0.1, yeah, if that was, that seemed weird to you. Now we just have to substitute, nothing new here, yeah. This is the formula that I was talking about. Uh, once you put everything in, I think you can go ahead and figure out the answer to this. And I'd like you to do that, yeah. Please leave me an answer in the comments, what is this going to be? What's, what, what is the value of W2 going to be? Please let me know. An important takeaway here is that we did not use the approximation. What approximation? You know what I'm talking about, right? I told you that in some cases, you could say that, hey, N1 is much greater than N2. Mm, can you do that here? Is that a valid approximation? If you did, things would get really funny. So think about it, yeah? In every question that comes to you, know the first principles and then you see if an approximation is valid or not. Now, please go ahead and give me an answer to this question in the comments.